Good morning. Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad to see you all here today. We're going to go ahead and get started with our praise time with page 99, God Will Take Care of You. chill singing that song because guess who I just saw walk in our hmm Winston Richards is here today guys I just have to oh my goodness he's here I'm so happy okay all right next song 539 I will early seek the savior
Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each one of you to uh, the Stand Up for Gap Seventh Day Adventist Church this morning. We all made it through the night, and we're all here. Praise the Lord, and uh, we thank God continually for giving us the Sabbath. So we studied the Sabbath in our lesson that God gave this day to be a blessing, and we're so thankful for it. Now, in your bulletin, you should have got uh, one of these. This is tonight. We've been mentioning it, uh, but in case it's snuck up on you, uh, this program, uh, Dr. Wesley Youngberg uh, from out at uh, uh, Loma Linda University and uh, a private practice also, uh, he's coming tonight to talk about um, uh, cognitive uh, uh, decline or Alzheimer's or uh, dementia, how to prevent it. And if you feel that you're beginning to forget things already, uh, you know, uh, what's the best way to, per to prevent the continua continuation of this cognitive decline? Okay, we, uh, there's more of these out there. Uh, if you have anybody that you can invite, I, this is not much warning because it's this evening over at the Collegedale Community Church and it's going to be from 6 to 9. Uh, PM and so it's going to be something this is really the cutting edge now uh, that, that you can actually use lifestyle in order to uh, uh, stop cognitive decline and even reverse it then following that uh, coming up right here at uh, Santa Fe Gap at the school auditorium across there we have Dr. Youngberg's uh, follow-up uh, this is uh, 12 weeks to wellness and that is going to begin uh, Tuesday evening, and uh, so this tonight over at the Coliseo Community Church, we'll have uh, the, the big program there, and then we're going to follow up with the 12 Weeks to Wellness uh, beginning on Tuesday uh, evening, in, in which uh, we're going to follow the, the programs here. You're uh, encouraged to invite your uh, uh, friends and neighbors for that. Uh, now, this 10-day challenge, this is not really something that we are putting on. Uh, but uh, it's also going to be uh, over here. This is a 10-day challenge that if you have thought, you know, I wonder what it's like uh, to uh, be a vegetarian or to uh, uh, be a vegan or anything, uh, and where do I start, what do I do? Uh, on this 10-day health challenge, uh, uh, Gabriel will provide food for you for 10 days. Uh, they'll provide uh, two meals a day uh, for 10 days, plus a smoothie there, uh, and they'll deliver it. They'll deliver it where you work, they'll deliver it to your home, uh, they'll deliver it for you. So uh, if, if somebody wants to just try out vegetarian, uh, vegan eating for uh, uh, 10 days, they can uh, uh, sign up for this. Uh, also tonight, there's going to be a table there uh, that uh, they have, or uh, there's a telephone number here. If you said, hey man, I would really like for someone to feed me for 10 days a, a delicious vegetarian. He has a, a restaurant, a vegetarian vegan restaurant, so they cook uh, vegan all the time. Uh, he's going to provide that food f uh, for you for 10 days. You can sign up for that. Uh, it's, you can sign up tonight or you can call them and uh, sign up. Uh, we're looking forward to this and uh, so uh, please plan on being here each Tuesday evening for the, uh, the 12 weeks to wellness. And if you can at all make it, uh, go tonight to the uh, College Hill Community Church for how to avoid cognitive decline. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. It's good to see everyone out here today. First off, I would like to make a correction that's in the bulletin. We will not be going out for our project rescue ministry at four, but at what time? Two, Two o'clock, and we will meet here at the church. We have everything here at the church, so we will be here at two. Also, to everyone that has given grocery bags, keep them coming, thank you. We appreciate it, it saves us, what is it Tara, about $11 a case? $15 a case, so they went up. See, I got, t Tara does the orders now. $15 a case for bags. So you're saving us plenty of money seeing as we do need more. So don't forget about donations. It could be food. It could be monetary. If it's monetary, you have to mark it on your envelope for homeless ministry or project rescue. And Brother Doug, he got our back. So 
Thank you, everyone, for showing up to see Jesus today. Thank you for everyone that's going to come out. It's not going to rain. I, I, I can just about guarantee you, I think I sent my message up, Faith. So it's not going to rain. Um, and let's go out and spread some love today. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. It's good to have you all here today. Happy Sabbath. What? Okay, go ahead. Happy Sabbath. Very good. That's nice. Well, it's good to have you all here today. Uh, we have a couple of thank yous that came in, um, and they'll be posted in the back, but uh, Ryan Mamora, um, who is our intern, or extern, I forget which way it goes. Extern, yes. Anyhow, he, he sent a nice thank you card for us. And he is in Hawaii now, or will be there soon. But he wanted to send a nice thank you. And then also um, the James family, uh, Jerry James and family, sent a card for all of the flowers and the, and the prayers that went out with the loss of his brother. So these two cards will be out, out in the front um, when we're done. Um, also, uh, the Finance Committee will have a meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m., so just remember to go to that. And then also a church board meeting will be August 1 at 7 p.m. All right, thank you very much. One other announcement is that this week at prayer meeting, our literature, our school literature team will be here and they'll be sharing some of the books that they have. If you would like to purchase some of those books, it goes towards their education to help them go to our school across the street so if you're part of prayer meeting or want to be here to help with that you'll see there's information in the bulletin i've got a chance to go out with them a couple times and god has blessed them and being able to share our literature with many many people as well as actually contacting many people many for bible studies and other follow-up that our uh, bible worker team is um, dealing with and helping Second announcement I have is in your bulletin. It's a very good picture of you, Ian. I really, I really do like that. <laughs> I think Jerry somehow figured that one out and came up with that. Um, what it is is uh, this is unfortunately a farewell. Yes, there's a slide for the farewell. He's doing our sermon next week because it's his farewell Sabbath. And then there's a bonfire and Vespers is what this insert in the bulletin is all about. It'll be starting at 6.30. And it's, we're going to be doing it up here at the Family Center. Then we'll be going over there. The Pathfinders are then also planning a um, gym night. So we're trying to get everything in in one time. Pastor Ian, before you, before you go. It's sad, but... I know that you're keeping him in your prayers and Christiana as well as they move on with many new chapters in their life, marriage as well as into the seminary. So uh, we're going to come and we're, we're sad, but we wish you well in that transition time. The next thing, Cindy and I are going to do this together. Why don't you start? We just want to invite all of you to come to Like Arrows. If you are a parent, ever been a parent, we're always a parent, I guess, if you've been a parent, and, or you ever hope to be a parent, this movie is for you. Um, I've seen it twice. It is very moving. And this movie starts with a couple in the worst place you could possibly imagine and chronicles the grace of God throughout their 50 life, years. 50 years, and ends at their 50th anniversary and tells the story of God's grace and how he intersects their life in so many different ways. So you'll want to come and see this movie. It's, um, It'll be after um, Potluck on August 10, from 2.30 to approximately 4.30 uh, here in the sanctuary. And it's really a living parable. It's, not really, it's a movie, yes, but it's really a living parable of what God's grace can do. They start out not really applying much of God's principles in, their, in parenting, and then there's a transformation in, after some really crisis moments in their parenting and marriage, and they allow God to intervene, and there's a change that takes place, and at the 50th anniversary, you see the fruit of what happened because of that change. So I don't want to spoil it for you. Um, 
This movie is made by the Kendrick brothers, also have done Courageous Facing Overcomer, the Facing the Giants, um, War Room. So there, it is a quality product. You'll want to come and see it. It is a kickoff, as you can see, for the Art of Parenting, which we'll be offering throughout this fall. If you still have people in your house that you're parenting, you'll want to come. This is not, um, this seminar is very interactional. It has a lot of humor. Um, it's going to be a fun social occasion. We're going to have it in our house. We're just going to talk, eat, have fun. So if you've got people in your house that you're still Pregnancy praying over, uh, you're pregnant, you're thinking of getting pregnant, please come. And we have a short promo. If you're not, we won't, we won't, we won't <laughs> try to assume anything. We don't want anything to get out or anything. Child care will be provided for this as well as the parenting classes. Some have asked already about that. And yes, it will be provided. If you're a grandparent and you want to offer a gift to your adult children, your grandchildren, and you say, yes, I want to help provide child care, then please come and talk to us. Uh, that's a gift that you can pass on. Now we're going to look at a trailer that's about two and a half minutes just to kind of give you an idea of what it's all about. Scare you at all to be a parent? Nope. Okay, maybe a little bit. We got this thing outnumbered. It's too grown up to get one little bitty baby. We got to. Ronnie. His name is Ronnie. When it comes to raising kids, the days are long, but the years are short. Short enough, if you ask me. Tonight we need to talk about Kate. She was. I guess hitting other kids in church yesterday. Okay, we'll talk about it. Great. I'm so glad you're interested in your kids' lives. Honey, the only reason that Kate is still here is because she is too young to leave. You know what? This is going nowhere. Sit down! Just leave me alone! And she's falling right after Ronnie. Look me up sometime. Bye, Mom. We have two more coming up after her. She's not your real mom anyway. Your real mom couldn't handle you. And they're gonna follow right after her. I mean, we have got to get help. Our kids aren't the problem. It's us, man. You can't run around living life one day at a time. You gotta know where you're going. And then lead. Here we go. That will be your legacy. It's my legacy of faithful love. You just have to remember, our job is to be faithful. Change is up to God. Then we invite you to come on the 10th if you want to leave a spiritual, eternal legacy for your children. Please stand and let's sing our opening hymn. Oh, joyful.
I invite you to kneel with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we turn our eyes upon you, we're just so thankful that you are our Heavenly Father and that you love each one of us and we, we are your children. And as we see things happening all around us in the world today, not only in our own country, but other parts of the world, we know there's a great controversy going on but Lord, we've seen the last chapter. We know how it's going to end, and it can't end soon enough for us to go. And as we hear the rain falling outside, we pray that the rain of your Holy Spirit may fall upon our hearts and water us this morning as we've come to worship. Lord, we have many things on our mind and on our hearts that we'd like to present to you. There's people that need healing, physically, emotionally. Our families need healing. There's a lot of healing that needs to be taken place, dear Lord, and we pray that to you as the divine healer that you would just reach out and, and touch each one and, and may your will be done and, and we pray that we can feel your presence. We pray for those that might be discouraged. I pray that you would give them the encouragement and the great hope that we have. We pray for those who cannot be here today that would like to be, and I just pray that you give them a special Sabbath day's blessing also. Bless our various ministries and outreaches that are going on. And as we plant the gospel seed, we pray that it may be watered by your Holy Spirit and there'll be a harvest of souls as a result. And Lord, we just turn our lives over to you again today. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. Our scripture lesson this morning is found in Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31. And you can turn in your Bibles or however you have the Word of God before you or on the screen. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible this morning. Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. 
Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you in a, a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say also, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And I'm so thankful that here in our church we're attempting to do this through our ministry of the homeless and the manna. And I'm sure the Lord will bless each one of us as we continue to support this wonderful ministry that we have. Amen. You know, when you open the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, it says that um, God is established as the creator. And then as you read throughout the Bible, all the stories in the Bible, he's, the question comes up, who is Lord? The rest of the Bible just asks the question, who is the Lord in this story? Who is the Lord in this story? Who is in charge? And who is the Lord in your life? Who is the Lord of, of your mind? Who is the Lord of your eyes? Who is the Lord of your finances, of your heart, of your family? Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19 says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may feel, fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. So basically, there's nothing. You have nothing left. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. For the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me to walk on the high hills. So is God your strength this morning? When you look at your bills, your finances, is the Lord your strength? May the deacons please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you be our strength. We ask that you be not just our God, but the Lord of our life, the Lord of our finances, the Lord of our, fam our families, the Lord of everything in our lives. So we give that to you. We surrender all. And we just ask and pray you bless the things we give back to you today. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, without hurting anyone's feelings, it's the best time of the service for me. It's the children's story. So if the analogies are too deep for me this morning, I'll know I'll get something out of Lonnie's children's story. So, and everyone in this church has a role to do and a job to do, and, and this is the time for the children to do their job. It is what we need you to do, kids. So go in the back, there's a basket for you, and if you would just, you know, spread out in an organized fashion and do your best, we'd appreciate it. And Lonnie's going to tell us a great story. If you could only have the blessing of seeing what I see, all these young people going around gathering for Jesus. Put it right up there. Oh, yes. They don't know exactly, some of them don't know what they're doing, but they love doing it. They're working for Jesus. Well, boys and girls, my story today is about a boy named John. John was like you. He kind of grew up. But do you know what? As John got into high school, he forgot something. He forgot about Jesus. And Jesus wasn't the most important thing in his life. And do you know what? John decided he was going to go in the military. And some of his friends kind of said, well, what are you going to do about being a Christian? He said, I, I won't worry about that till I get there. So John got the basic training, and the year went by, and then two years went by, and it was time for John to get out. So he came home, and some of his friends met him, and they had a party, and they said, John, how things go? John said, what do you mean? Well, you know, you're a Christian, John. How did it go? And do you know what he said? It's so sad what he said. He said, they never found out. Because you know what John did? Do you know the song that we sing, This Little Light of Mine? I'm going to let it shine. John didn't let his shine. He hid his light under the bushel. There's somebody in the Bible, though, that never, never hid his light. And our story has to do, and you need to tell me, who was the person that had an encounter with a lion? Do you know who had an encounter with a lion? His name was Daniel. Is your name Daniel? Yeah, I thought so. You never had an encounter? I've never had an encounter with a lion either. But Daniel did something. Do you remember we've talked about P.O.P., the power of prayer? Well, Daniel knew the power of prayer, didn't he? But you know what? Daniel was loved by the king. The king back there loved Daniel. 
But there were some people there that did not like Daniel. And they wanted to hurt him if they could. But Daniel did everything right. He didn't do things wrong. So they thought, they thought we're going to have to trap Daniel. So they went to the king and they said, oh, great king, you're so great. Let's make a law that no one, not even Daniel, could worship anyone else for 30 days. That's a long time, isn't it? Well, they knew that Daniel always would pray to his God. And Daniel didn't hide. He didn't run and hide. When he heard this law, he didn't go hide in a corner. He didn't get in a closet. He still knelt down in the window where he lived, and he prayed to God three times. Well, the king made that law thinking, oh, this will be great. But do you know what? He didn't think about Daniel. And once Daniel heard that, he continued to pray. And what do you think the bad people did? What do you think they did to Daniel? That, that's right. The king heard that, that there was somebody that was not worshiping him. And he was sad when he found out who it was because it was Daniel. And you're right. They threw him in the lion's den. And you know what? The king didn't sleep very good that night because he was worried. He was worried that things were going to happen and his friend Daniel would be killed. But do you remember what happened? The king came in and said, Daniel, are you okay? And what did Daniel say? Did he say, what did he say? My God sent an angel to shut whose mouth? That's right. To shut the lion's mouth. And Daniel was okay. And the king was so happy. And you know what, boys and girls? We need to let our light shine, don't we? So others see Jesus in us. No matter what others think, we need to follow Jesus, don't we? Who would like to have our prayer today? Would one of, Daniel, would you like to have it today? Since our story was about Daniel? All right, you still have our prayer. Okay, let's have our prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for having a good day at church. And happy Sabbath to everybody that we can save everybody from hell and to, to sweetness. And then we'll pray for you all day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. All right, boys and girls, let's go back to our chair. But the pastor has something for you first. Remember, kids, to put your names on the sheets because you'll see your name goes in the bulletin next Sabbath. And then we'll be back there with the prizes today. We have something special. I'm going to ask Kenny to come up, and Katie Anderson, along with Felicity, and a new member of the family, Albright. Yeah, Albright, come on up. We just wanted to we get you a chance to, to be introduced to Aubrey Bell Anderson. She was born on the 28th of April. I just want to have, I'm going to ask Pastor Ian to come up. We're just going to have a special prayer of blessing for you. They're going to do a dedication later, but we wanted to just to welcome her to our family. She's very pleasant. She's, she's having a nice time. Let's bow our heads. Dearly Father, we thank you so much um, for family, 
We thank you for uh, giving us this church family, and we thank you for bringing Aubrey into our family. Um, thank you so much for bringing them, bringing her into uh, Kenny and Katie's life and Felicity's life too. Um, I know that uh, they will take care of her, they will cherish her, Lord, because this is a gift from you, just as Felicity is as well. I pray that you continue to bless them as they raise her, continue to give them your wisdom and their strength. And help us as a church family here to be supportive, to be there, and to help them in whatever they may need as they raise uh, baby Aubrey. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you so much for giving Aubrey to us. And may we do our very best to take care of her and teach her more about you. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Oh, there are some people here, aren't there? How many of you have seen the signs as you're going down the street saying love is why? Anybody? Not very many people have seen it. Well, our pastor, our preacher today is going to be explaining why, isn't he? Why do we do things for others. Why? I'm going to sing to you about why I feel this way. love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so kind and true I would tell you why he changed my life completely he did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. Oh, how much he cares for me, man can me no work. Oh, how much he cares for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me. And he led me in the way that I should go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. 
no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. We have the privilege today to have Brother Jonathan Duffy. He is the president of ADRA. Many of you know all about ADRA, probably have given to it, have read the newsletter or letters from Brother Duffy. And uh, his wife Kathy is here, as well as I saw friends as well that are here, and probably will be part of them tonight at the University Church. They're going to be doing some more sharing stories, I believe, from ADRA and what has been happening, how God has blessed um, this humanitarian, international humanitarian ministry of our world church. So, Brother Jonathan. Thank you for coming and sharing with us God's working and blessing. Thank you. Um, it is a, a, a real privilege to be here this morning. Um, there, there's, you know, every so often it's difficult sometimes being the itinerant and sometimes you just come to a church and you just feel at home and, and uh, you know, this church has such a lovely, friendly feeling to it and... Uh, as Ron sang today, I don't know why, but um, his voice was very similar to a man from my home church where I spent the first six years of my life in, in country New South Wales in Australia. And it just took me home to my home church, really. Uh, similar size, except if we'd only have the two rows, we'd have to cut off the others, but otherwise a sort of a, a, a similar size church. And uh, I think the power of... of of a home church in a person's life is something which leaves an indelible mark on them. And, uh, you know, later in life, I, I was the health director for the South Pacific Division for a number of years, and my research was in youth resilience and how do we protect young people from drugs, alcohol, early initiation of sex, other risk behaviors, suicide. And uh, much of the issue came down to them having a community to which they could belong to. And, uh, you know, and I just get that feel about this church, that it's one of those churches that is, is a special church that actually really does um, value its young people and creates that sense of community. Um, I'm not going to take a, a great deal of time to, to tell ADRA stories. I have a little bit of a belief, and that is that tonight I can talk about ADRA stories. Today is the sermon time, and so what we need is a sermon rather than an advertorial. Um, but let me say this to you. I mean, ADRA is in 140 countries around the world. It does bring aid to between 15 and 20 million people each year, depending on the work that it does. And as much that we can rejoice in the work, both the long-term sustainable development work and the emergency response that we do. Um, but to me, I, 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 I have a burden in my heart, and that is what I'm going to preach on, and, and that is that I don't want... 22 million Adventists to be proud of an agency. I want 22 million Adventists to see themselves as an agent of hope and healing in their own communities. And if we could get that, then the impact that we have is going to be way beyond 15 to 20 million, million people. And that's really what I believe that we're, we are brought towards. And that's why, really, um, I produced this, year, this quarter's lesson series. Um, entitled The Least of These, and uh, on actually helping to remind us. It's, it's, to me, it's not about an either or. Sometimes we get a little bit caught up between Matthew 28 and the Gospel and Matthew 25, the practical arm, and we talk about them as if they're separate or competing, whereas actually it's a wholeness of the Gospel and a completion of it. And many of us are blessed with different talents. Some are blessed with the gift of evangelism and just being able to talk to people. Others are blessed with hospitality. Others are blessed with practical skills that can make a difference. And it's about recognizing the wholeness 
that we have as a body of Christ, that the different talents come together on that. But since this quarter's lesson is about justice, then you are going to get my justice sermon. <laughs> so I'm just putting that out there in the front. And, I, you know, it's always very dangerous um, because I was looking at the bulletin and it has the time for the service to start at 1045 but it doesn't have an ending time, you know, and you give the pulpit over to one of these general conference circuit preachers and uh, who knows how long you're going to be stuck here for. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go with that, will we? Um, but it's actually, I've got to say, it's a little bit unusual to get the pulpit this early. Uh, often by the time the praise teams finishes and everything else, you know, you're often standing up at 12 o'clock and you think, oh my goodness, I'm not sure how much time I have left. But I would like to start this morning by asking you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine this morning that when you woke up, you heard that a passenger jet had crashed overnight, killing all on board. Now, unfortunately, that is not as an unusual event these days as it used to be. We, we would all have some interest. Where did the crash occur? Was it an act of terrorism, pilot error, or mechanical failure? What if the crash had occurred near here, Chattanooga Airport? Perhaps some of us might have seen some of the smoke rising as we drove to church. Our interest would be piqued, wouldn't it? It's local. It's relevant. Did we know someone who was on that plane, we'd think? So then I want you to imagine and expand your imagination beyond that. And I want you now to imagine that when you woke up this morning, that actually you heard the news that overnight, 100 passenger jets had crashed, killing all on board. Now, that would be huge news, wouldn't it? 100 jets crashed. You know, it would be on the news 24-7, the, the TV would be trying to fill in the space, talking to every, every self-proclaimed expert or whatever else on safe air travel. You, you think about the way that we live in a global sort of community these days. You know, un unfortunately, I don't say this to brag, but with Adra in 140 countries, I fly extensively around the world. You wake up, in, you know, go to sleep. You wake up in one country, you go to sleep in another country. We do trade across around the world and so forth. Imagine how much the economy and everything would change if they decided to ground every plane. Now, we all know the issues that have gone on recently with Boeing, the crash of two planes, and, and extensive research and the amount of press and time that's taken on with all of those things. It's, it's, it's just taken on a, a, a huge new dimension. But why is it then that when the number of children who die from preventable diseases every day, preventable diseases, is equivalent to 100 passenger jets crashing and killing all on board, it never reaches the news. It never reaches our conversations. It never reaches our, our, our thinking, even our consciousness. The equivalent of 100 jets, 30,000 young people every day dying of preventable diseases but it doesn't really enter into our news. When I was studying at university, I took on the leadership um, of a youth group for the local conference. Adelaide, where I grew up in South Australia, a small community where we all knew everyone. We'd put on a, a youth rally one Friday night a month. We put on a social activity one Saturday night a month. We put on a Sunday sporting activity one Sunday a month. And, and uh, it came to camp time. Now, and do we still have camp in, in this conference? And, and I don't know if it's the same, but camp used to start on Friday and, and it would go through for a week and end on Saturday evening. And it was on the first weekend of camp and, and the Sunday that we'd planned a, a social event for the young people. And we'd planned that we were going to ferry them. We'd organised with a small charter firm to, to ferry back and forth from Adelaide uh, over to a small um, island called Kangaroo Island just off the coast. It was just a short hop in the plane, about 20 minutes each way. Um, and so we chartered these planes to take the young people. Kangaroo Island is famous for its flora and fauna, and I was looking forward to it. I'd never been there. And on Sabbath morning, the, the conference president came and said to me, he said, Jonathan, 
um, our, our youth director has just been rushed to hospital. Uh, he's developed appendicitis, his appendix has burst, um, he's in a serious condition, they're operating him on as we speak with peritonitis. Um, would you stay behind on Sunday and run the beach activities for the kids that weren't going to Kangaroo Island? Now, I was a bit disappointed at missing out on that, as you can imagine, so I stayed behind. Sunday morning came, the young people who were going off to Kangaroo Island all left and went to the airport and were ferried back and forth and we had our beach day and we got back from the beach day all a bit sunburnt and hot and, and showering and it came time for the evening um, program and, and gradually the young people who had gone to Kangaroo Island were sort of filtering through because, you know, it's small planes and, you know, there's ferrying and so as each came they were returning to camp and just before the start of the evening program we got the news that the last plane to, cat to take off had crashed, killing all on board. Killed four of the young people from a youth group and the pilot. And the conference president had the presentation that evening to kick off the series that he was going to take. And his son was the president of our youth club at the time. And his son was the one who stayed behind last. And he died. And he was meant to get up and give a talk. You can imagine the impact that had on the camp meeting. It, it, it wasn't the usual camp meeting. There was much soul searching. There was much, you know, um, sorrow, grieving, um, studying God's word for comfort. Um, it changed us. And even now, when I go home to Adelaide, my hometown in South Australia, and I meet up with some of the young people who are in the same era as me, we still remember that crash. But why is it that we remember so vividly the crash that killed four of the young people from our youth group, but we actually never think about the 30,000 lives that die each day of young children who have died from, from preventable diseases? Why is it that it has such a, 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 an impact upon us? Why is it that our compassion for others seems to be directly correlated to whether people are close to us socially, emotionally, culturally, ethnically, economically, and geographically. How do you think God might think about this issue? Does he look at the suffering of a child in Cambodia or Malawi with a certain sense of emotional distance? Does God have different levels of compassion for children based on their geographical location, their nationality, their race, or their parents' income? Does he forget about their pain because he is preoccupied with other things? Does he turn the offending page to read the sports section? Or is his heart broken because each child is precious to him? Amen. God surely grieves and weeps because every one of these children is his child, not somebody else's. On the streets of Moldova, we found an orphaned five-year-old girl living in a cardboard box, nearly naked, hungry, dirty and afraid, looking after her three-year-old brother. Her mother had left the family shortly after the birth of her brother, leaving them in the sole care of their father. Four months earlier, their father had passed away from the health effect of their lives in poverty, leaving them totally alone with no one concerned for their well-being. In Syria, a successful businessman was forced to flee with his family when ISIS attacked their community. He packed everything he could into one of their three cars and escaped to the border where he was forced to leave everything behind. He and his family now live in a refugee camp for the last three years in the hope of getting refugee status to take his family to Australia. Why is it that the story of a refugee family who lost everything doesn't have the same effect upon us as the story of a child? We tend to compartmentalise our compassion. In Matthew 25, we are reminded of a well-known piece of scripture where the sheep are separated from the goats. Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. I was naked, hungry, thirsty. Well, you say, I'm comfortable with those things. You know, I am happy to help staff a soup kitchen or to raise money for a well. But are we really happy to provide these things? How do, we live, how do we remain silent in a world where US $6 billion is required to provide basic education for all, 
yet it never happens. But Americans spend $8 billion a year on cosmetics. $11 billion is required to provide water and sanitation for all, yet it never happens. But Europeans spend $11 billion per year on ice cream. $13 billion is required to provide basic health and nutrition to all, yet it never happens. But globally, we spend $780 billion a year on military. If we truly believe in Matthew 25, can we remain silent in a world of injustice, exploitation and greed? The issue is not a shortage of resources, it is the distribution of resources. America is considered one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet in 2009, one in 50 children, a total of 1.5 million children, were homeless. By 2013, that figure had jumped to one in 30 children, or a total of 2.5 million children being homeless. One in six people in America face hungry, hunger. Unfortunately, they haven't updated the figures since 2013, so I've got to give you the stats from there. In 2013, 17.5 million households in the US were food insecure, not people, households. 49 million Americans struggle to put food on the table. Now, I would like to point out that I am a stronger believer in the power of prayer. But too often we find it easier to pray that a poor friend's needs might be met when God placed us here to be the solution and also provided us with the means to be the solution. But now for the hard ones. A stranger. A refugee. Well, if it is safe for my family and they don't take away any jobs from me, a prisoner. Um, what was their crime? In 2015, over one million refugees crossed into Europe, sparking a crisis in how we deal with these unprecedented numbers. At the moment, we have 72 million people in the world who are refugees or internally displaced people. ISIS had destroyed these people's homes, robbed from them, and destroyed their businesses and killed many of their relatives and then inserted themselves in this, into this humanitarian mass of people, linking them with acts of terrorism like the Paris bombings. If you really wanted to hate somebody, you couldn't do much of a better job, could you? You make the whole world hate them. Now we see countries closing their borders to them. Bloomberg surveyed the American public. 53% said they did not want any Syrian refugees in the United States. A further 28% said they only wanted to let Christian refugees in. So in some way, 81% said they did not want to give refuge to Syrian refugees. But what are the concept of Samantha Finberg? Now, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to be political here. So her quote was actually a quote that she wrote before the current government and you'll see why I want to say that disclaimer in a minute. So Samantha Finberg Bin is the head of Project Happiness, and she stated, when you have more than you need, build a bigger table, not a higher fence. Where do we sit with these issues as Christians? Is our compassion limited to matters that we are passionate about or move us in some emotive way? Is our compassion limited by our social boundaries, our own comfort zone, or our own safety. In Matthew 5, verses 43 to 45, we read, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Former member of European Parliament, Tony Benn, stated this. He said, the way a government treats refugees is very instructive because it shows how they would treat the rest of us if they thought they could get away with it. What statement do we make as individuals, as a church, in how we respond to those referred to in Matthew 25 as the least of these? When I look at the life of Christ, I often wonder how many people he healed 
We were told everywhere he went, people surrounded him. Then I think, where were they when he was on trial? Where were they when the crowd cried, crucify him? Were they conveniently absent? Did they wring their hands in frustration of their inability to speak out and make a difference? Did they weep silently, ridden with guilt by their own cowardice? In Matthew 25, we are told to view the least of these as Christ himself. If we do nothing, are we any different to those who remain silent in the crowd when they cried, crucify him? In Matthew 5, 13 to 16, we read, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstead, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I didn't even talk to the person who had the story this morning about light, but there we have it. Now John Stott, a well-known um, Christian author, well-known preacher, on writing about salt and light, puts it like this. He says, Our Christian habit is to bewail the world's deteriorating standards with an air of rather self-righteous dismay. We criticise its violence, dishonesty, immorality, disregard for human life and materialistic greed. The world is going down the drain, we say with a shrug. But whose fault is it? Who is to blame? Let me put it like this. If the house is dark when nightfall comes, there is no sense in blaming the house. That is what happens when the sun goes down. The question to ask is, where is the light? Similarly, if the meat goes bad and becomes inedible, there is no sense in blaming the meat. That is what happens when bacteria are left alone to breed. The question to ask is, where is the salt? Just so, if society deteriorates and its standards decline until it becomes like a dark night or stinking fish, there is no sense in blaming society. That is what happens when more fallen men and women are left to themselves and human selfishness un is unchecked. The question to ask is, where is the church? Why are the salt and light of Jesus Christ not permeating and changing our society? It is sheer hypocrisy on our part to raise our eyebrows, shrug our shoulders, or wring our hands. The Lord Jesus told us to be the world's salt and light. If therefore darkness and rottenness abound, it is largely our fault, and we must accept the blame. Now that's a pretty heavy burden to place on us on a Saturday morning, is it? On a Sabbath morning. But I want to take a minute just to look at the role that church played in society and the historical nature. If we look at it, hospitals were founded by churches. They were actually founded by churches to serve the sick. Schools were founded by churches in order to be able to, to, to provide education, to lift children out of poverty. Prisons were founded by churches in order to bring about reform. Uh, the early church talked about the abolition of slavery, talked about the rights of women. In fact, the Adventist church, Ellen White, was a very strong advocate for issues of justice. A and, um, you know, when we wrote, when wrote the Sabbath School Lesson series, the first draft, they said, you have to put more Ellen White quotes in the Sabbath School Lesson series. So, we, you know, I wanted to start in Genesis and go through to Revelation and look, look at what the Bible said on the topic. So that drove back into a much deeper study of Ellen White. And as we dove more into Ellen White, the more I came to see her as a strong advocate for issues of justice and equality and to speak out for the least of these. And in fact, Elder Daniels, who shared time in Australia with her, when she was um, in Australia in her Australian years, and at the time was a general conference president um, at, at her death, and he gave the eulogy 
for her at her funeral. If you ever get the chance, look up that eulogy. And what that eulogy, when he talks about Ellen White, he didn't talk about so much her as a person um, and all the incredible things and ticking off all the achievements of her life and the number of books that she wrote. What he mainly centred on was the issues of justice. And somewhere we've lost our way a little bit in that. So in World War I, we saw a major transition in how the church saw its role in society. So church had been a central part of society. There was a separation of church and state, and yet church still remained with a moral voice in society, speaking out on issues of justice, of mercy, of compassion, of the values of society. When World War I came, the world went to war, and it went to war, and, and, and with war, the whole world at war, such a scale of war, and war is not just the battle that happens on the battlefield, it's the rape, the pillaging, everything that happens off that. And when the Christian world saw the whole world at war, they began to think, we can no longer change society. So they changed tact. They became more like the lifesaver, rowing around amongst this drowning mass of humanity, pulling one soul into the boat at a time, saving them from society rather than seeing ourselves as the agents of change for society. World War II came on the back of World War I. And with World War II coming so soon, and many people in Europe having experienced two world wars in their lifetime and all the atrocities, Europe began to say, where is God? There can't be a God. Why would God allow this to happen twice in my lifetime? And Europe began to become very secular. And with the rise in secularism, what we saw was we saw the separation of the things of the physical world to the things of the spiritual world. And spirituality, if you chose to be a spiritual person, was something that happened in your own individual thoughts and your relationship and your prayers and your study with God. And maybe you came together on church to talk about those things, but it was personal. Whereas the rest of the, your, uh, 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 of the week, you lived in the physical world where toil, labor, return on labor, power and wealth and other factors took place. So we saw this separation. And to a certain degree as a church, we allowed ourselves to be separated. And with that separation, more discussion takes place around doctrine, around theology of whose God is correct and so forth. And people see that as a spiritual dimension and things that are physical and, 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 and poverty is often seen to be physical. It's about a lack of resources, a lack of food, a lack of water, a lack of money, a lack of opportunity. And, and, and so we almost saw this diversion of the gospel where we centered on the evangelism part of the gospel, but we actually didn't center on the holism of the gospel. When God created the world, he created four relationships, the relationships of God to man, man to self, man to fellow man, and man to the environment. And all brokenness and sin comes from the breaking of those relationships. And all healing and restoration comes from the healing of those relationships. And if we want to be true, and if we want to be holistic in our gospel, then we've got to reach out to people to heal them across all levels of their brokenness. You now, sometimes people say to me, Jonathan, why do we need ADRA? You know, there's other agencies that could do those things. We need to concentrate on the gospel. And I say, but you must heal the whole person. We must be holistic. We must be total in, in, in our healing of people. And we have a holistic message. And that's why we need to be present in times of brokenness and disaster and, and, and inequality so that we can point them towards the wholeness and the completeness and the healing that God has for them. And so we saw this separation. But then what's changed is in the last probably four years, the German government wrote a paper on the role of religion in sustainable development. And what they said is that according to the census, 84.9% of the world's population is religious is affiliated with some form of religion, 84.9% of the world's population. And I said the strongest part of civil society is church. In, in many remote communities, there's nothing that brings the, ch the, 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 the community together except for religious service. And the leaders in those communities are seen to be the religious leaders. So if we want to end poverty, if we want to affect change in the community, if we want to do good, we cannot ignore the role that religion plays in society. 
And in fact, if we want to be agents of change in society, we have to learn how to engage more with religious leaders and religious, local religious communities. Now, this is amazing for a secular government. And it immediately took off like a wildfire. Suddenly, you've got the United Nations, which has been very anti-religion, suddenly saying, you know, they've got their 17 sustainable development goals to end poverty, extreme poverty by 2030. We cannot accomplish our agenda if we don't work with faith and faith actors and faith leaders. So they formed an advisory group to say, how can we actually learn? You know, we've shunned them, but now we know that these are important agents have changed in our society. How can we partner with them? Um, and and, and I, I'm the vice chair of that. So the Adventist church is in the center of trying to understand that actually a significant part of civil society is actually about faith. And it's faith which permeates and changes society. And so now the world's asking us to step forward. Now look towards us and say, well, you represent a faith-based organization. You represent a faith community. How is your community changing the world for good in which they live? And my question is, are we ready to give an answer? Are we ready to be the answer to that question? Are we truly agents of hope and healing in our world? I don't want 22 million Adventists cheering Adra. I want 22 million Adventists seeing themselves as agents and hope of healing in their own communities. And now society is measuring us as a faith community by whether or not we're prepared to act in that way. It's a change. But are we ready to step into that space? You know, we live in a world which is increasingly xenophobic. Brexit was about Britain for Brits. In my country, Australia, during the recent elections, a woman was elected to Parliament based upon the platform of no Muslims in Australia, no mosques, no halal foods, no provision for what in her terms is un-Australian. We live in a society full of increasing hate speech. You only have to listen to the conversations that took place in the past US elections and the conversations that are taking place today in our media to understand that we live in a society which is increasingly divided. We live in a society divided by the haves and the have-nots, a society where racial tensions are on the increase. And I debated whether to say this, but I'm going to say it. So afterwards you can tell me I was maybe inappropriate. And I don't say it as a political statement. We live in a society where mothers of children with certain skin types are warned warn their children before they get into the car to place their licenses and insurance papers in an obvious and open place so that they will not have to reach into a glove box or pocket that could be mistaken for an act of aggression. We live in a broken world. In Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36, we read, If you love those who love you, what credit is that for you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who, who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those who, whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to repaid, be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is, immerse, is merciful. Matthew 25 is not just about going to places where you have a good time, or having a great story to tell on your return. It is not just about speaking on topics which are popular or safe, or will only benefit my personal agenda. There is a reason they are called the least of these and sometimes it drives us out of our comfort zone. Dealing with poverty can at times be confrontational, complicated and dirty. What the world needs is people who are willing to speak love. People who through their words and actions will point people toward a loving saviour who desires their good. A saviour who offers hope and healing to their brokenness. A saviour who desires peace and reconciliation for this brokenness. Are we willing as a church to give voice to the social outcast? Are we willing to champion the issues of justice even if they're unpopular? He said go, but are we prepared to go regardless of where he asks us to go? And do whatever he asks us to do? Or is our compassion driven by our social norms in our own safety. 
In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, well-known verse, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord uh, require of you? Act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We can all do that, can't we? We've taken this as a new motto for Adra. Justice, mercy, love. We can all be that. You know, there, there is a, a, an unknown quote or, or an unknown author that's a, a famous quote that I've come across and I want to end with this and I want you to contemplate it. It says, Sometimes I would like to ask the Lord, why does he allow such injustice, such pain, such hurt, such grief in the world when he could do something about it? And the quote goes on to say, So why did you ask him? Might be a good, appropriate question for me as the president of Andrew to ask him. So why don't you ask him? Because I'm afraid he would ask me the same question. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, all of us sitting here today have been broken in some way. All of us have been in need of hope and healing and as we've travelled through life and the different bruises and pains and experiences that we've had, and we're just too grateful that you as a loving saviour have been there to be our agent of hope and healing, that within your love we've found restoration, Lord. And I pray for those who've come here this morning looking for hope and healing. I pray that they might find the healing through the touch, through the kind word, through the actions of those of us that are gathered in this community here today, Lord. But just as we've experienced your healing, you healed us for a purpose. You ask us to be your agents of hope and healing. You ask us to reflect to the world your love. Our prayer this morning is that may our hearts be broken by the things that break your heart. And in that brokenness, might we find the strength to allow you in, that you might shine within us, that you might be able to use us to be your salt and your light in this broken world is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 575, Let Your Heart Be Broken. Let's all stand and sing our closing hymn. <clears throat> Let your heart be broken for a world in need.
Then the king will answer and say to them, that surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then the king answers them saying, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. 